being of the Women's Leadership Project. Uh, I'm Karen Kowal from the Artistic Director of ACT, and if you haven't, how many people have never been in this space? So this is the Strand, this is our amazing new performance venue, it was a porn theater, we, yeah, in a very complicated neighborhood, and many, many people helped to resurrect it as this big red clown nose of a space. Okay, uh, I don't, it has I don't this gorgeous an space, it has an amazing flexible space upstairs, yeah, it has so a great lobby, it has a great blowing deck. You're going to be meeting right. in some corner right. of this right. building um, at some point uh, during the course of the day. So I would be remiss, because I always have to start this way, to thank the woman who actually made this building happen, who's our board chair, Nancy Livingston, and she's here somewhere. <laughs> Um, so we're here today uh, to convene, to converse, how you move the dial about what we trust in leadership. The challenging thing for us in the theater, in the nonprofit world in America, is that unlike other industries, like, I don't know, academe or medicine or the law, where you are peer-reviewed as you move along your career path, for the leadership jobs in these theaters, the executive director or artistic director leadership jobs, those jobs are chosen by a board of trustees who are civilians, and they're not in our industry for the most part. And that's a very odd, complicated, interesting challenge. So it's a big question to say, how are these people from all over the country who are entrusted with our theaters making those leadership decisions, and how can we help open that pool out and change the image of who is trusted with leadership in our field? Um, it also has to do with who's doing the searches and, and how do search firms think about how to look for and calibrate competency and skill set in our industry. So um, there are lots and lots of questions that came up in the survey and out of those we teased out a series of um, aggregate areas that we're going to break out and discuss this afternoon. So the course of the day is this. Sumeru and Annika from Wellesley are going to present their research, which is completely fascinating. And don't get dispirited because there's, you know, light at the end of the tunnel and action to be taken. Um, then this amazing group of women is going to have just a brief response in each of their own uh, areas to what they've heard. We'll open this up to you all to share thoughts, questions that you hope for for the day or responses you have. Then we get to eat lunch. And then we're going to break into groups to talk about, to try and tease out areas Mentorship, skills building, child care work balance, board advocacy, visioning leadership in different ways to share thoughts. And what our hope is for these afternoon sessions is if you're an expert in one of these areas, bring your best practices, bring what you know, share with us links that we can go to to learn more, bring your best questions. And out of this, we're going to collect an email list. We're not assuming you all want to opt in unless you do because we don't want to Violate your privacy and just take your email. But if you want to stay part of this dialogue, it starts this morning with Howl Round. We're blessing you from out of far because they're live streaming this. Let's all do it. Working at Howl Round has been an incredible gift. They've been amazingly supportive of this, and they're live streaming this session all morning. So, to those of you watching from other places, we hope you will also join and be part of the conversation. And then we will, our, you know, it is our hope at the end of the day, even though it is a room full of genius women who could solve anything, we're not going to solve all of this today. But what I'm hoping, what we're all hoping, is that enough specific sparks have been lit that people will take corners of this that matter to them, stay in their aggregate, and, and run with it. We are sophisticated enough as business people, theater makers, artists, board members, collaborators, to figure out how to do that, how to move the dial on the things that we most care about. So we've all been to a lot of conferences where there's great talk and it ends today. So our conversation has to not end today, it has to keep going in very specific, tangible ways. There are many outlets to help make this happen. Theater has great service organizations around the country. There are lots of people here from areas outside the theater that can help us learn best practices in their field. So that's sort of the goal of today. And I just want to say about um, uh, our team, this conference, this convening happened because of 
three women at ACT. Bethany Heron, Rose Oser, on as young women leaders and said this conference matters to me and we're going to make it happen and they've worked just I can't even tell you hundreds and hundreds of hours over the last couple of over the whole last year to make this happen so when you see them thank them because they really carried this journey forward and the person who's the spark plug behind it all is <laughs> ACT's associate producer Aaron Michelle Watt. nonprofit movement. For let us not forget the women that were the leaders of the regional theater movement. Let's clap it up for them. So today we are in a quest to use our creative minds and our souls to re-envision how we look at what leadership is. Without a new question, we cannot create a new space. So today I hope that we all ask a question we've never asked before. I hope that we go to bat with our thoughts in a beautiful way. I hope that we are open to a new way of thinking today, that we can envision our field five and 10 and 15 years later different than it is now. Do you think we can do it? <laughs> so before we move to our rock stars of the hour, I just want you to take a moment and to think within yourself. Think about a woman that influenced you. Think about a woman in your life that's special, that you feel helped you to get to this space. Just take a moment, remember that person. And when I say one, two, three, scream that person's name out into space and bring them here. You ready? You might even want to throw your arms up. <laughs> you say it Do something that reminds you of them. Ready? One, two, Three. Yeah. Hey, I know we got two more. Let's do two more. One more. <laughs> one, two, three. Yeah. And one more. One, two, three. Yeah. Great. Our research is so good. Anonymously, 
by the people we interviewed, and some of you are in this room, and you may recognize your own words. It's, it's our privilege to know who you are, but we will, as we promised, never share who said what. <laughs> I'm delighted to be opening this research panel to share with you what we learned from you, and I really mean that very seriously because we learned as uh, researchers in the field of women's leadership, we came to this with our own language and had to learn theater speak. We didn't know the difference between what a producer does and what is a production director's job. You know, in English, those two words sound so much alike. <laughs> but we had to learn. And we had many wonderful teachers. Some of you are in this room. Thank you for being patient with us. Some of you couldn't be here and say, break a leg. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's passed into the English language, so we all understand. <laughs> OK. Um, in our program and in the notes for our research summary, we thank a number of people who made this work possible. And that includes not only the people who thought it would be a good idea to do the work, Carrie and Ellen, but their boards that supported, the board members that supported this as a good idea, including Nancy, who's sitting here, who was extremely helpful. And one of the Wellesley Centers for Women's Board members at the time, Alex Sanger, had the wisdom to say, consider applying to the Tulman Foundation. They might be interested in supporting this work. And we did. And they were very generous, as was the Valentine Foundation. And then our home institution, Wellesley Centers for Women, also pitched in with money for dissemination, which we are very grateful for. And then there were individuals who donated money out of their pockets, and some of you are here. Thank you. Thank you for believing that this is an important thing to do and support. Um, I will now go on to talk about what we set out to do. So let's just stop right there. As social science researchers, when we study a topic, we need to know what we learn, to whom it will apply. It is always important from the point of view of making generalizations to have a sample that's well defined. And the Lord Membership Theaters became our sample because it was easy to understand, well-known, and defined. And as Carrie said, this is not about studying Lord. It's about studying individual theaters that were members of Lord. The scope was diversity defined as gender and race and ethnicity, which leaves out the full range of human potential and in terms of gender, we worked with the gender binary, male, female, knowing full well that gender expression can take many, many forms and other forms of identification that influence a person's chances, exposure to discrimination, did not become a focus of this particular research because we needed to focus on a large enough group that we could do statistical analyses on. So we left out physical ability, we left out sexual orientation, we left out immigration status, um, a whole lot of 
sexual orientation that I mentioned that gender expression definitely left out class even though we couldn't ignore class when it was really well mentioned and you will see it in our, our words okay so this is what we focused on why are there so few women and what can be done about it the slide that shows what leadership looked like in the 2013-2014 season in the sample of theaters we were studying. <laughs> and during this silence I will give a definition of the word executive director, which was our shorthand for referring to the person who on a theater's masthead is listed at the top position of the administrative side. And in many theaters, the word managing director is used. In other theaters, there can be other words. Sometimes general managers are listed at the top. So that's just the shorthand. Um, when our task had been to understand why women are not leading theaters. Our focus on finding only one woman of color in any leadership position on the artistic or the executive side said to us, we have to look at what's going on with race and ethnicity. So to the extent that our data allowed it, we will be presenting information about that as well. So in another way of looking at it, this is what the field of leadership looks like. The others includes 43 women and six people of color. The one woman of color is counted twice. That's why it adds up to 48 instead of 49. <laughs> this is people listed on the masthead of a theater immediately below leadership. That's what we call next in line. People refer to this as pathway. Many different words can be used. we thought that this could be the solution to the problem. <clears throat> Looked at in another way. Wow. This is the, what the next in line, the potential solution looks like. together, we say that there is a clear, unadulterated glass ceiling problem facing women in general. There are enough of them who can see the top but can't get through. For professionals of color, there is a glass ceiling problem. There are sufficient numbers of interested aspiring and well-qualified professionals of color in and outside of theater who can step in. But there's an additional problem with attracting and keeping professionals of color in the theater. Now, we've arrived at these by doing a massive study <coughs> As Carrie mentioned, we work rather slowly. We don't do things in just one season. But now we learn that uh, putting together a season is, takes several years. 
We started out having conversations with about 30 people who were well placed in the world of theater, inside and outside of Lord, about what goes on. What are the important issues? And our conversations with these wonderful, generous people continue throughout the years that we did this work. We next collected resumes, CVs, bios of every single leader in the Lord system and people immediately will open and examined the career paths that were shown in each of their resumes, how they got to where they are now at the time that we were doing the work. About 300 of these resumes were analyzed. We then conducted two surveys. Laura Penn, thank you very much, who just said, yes, of course, you can survey our membership. We sent out a survey to about 1,500 members, director members of SDC. Some of you in this room answered our survey, thank you. And the response rate we received is higher than anything else we've seen. You get surveys, don't you, all the time? <laughs> I do. I say, thank you, bye-bye. <laughs> and about 40% answered. It gave us an incredible trove of information. And we also did a survey on the operational side. TCG shared with us uh, email addresses of people who were in executive positions and immediately below those of theaters of a million or more. So we felt that by going to the membership organizations we could step outside of the Lord system and look at the wider field of who is out there who could possibly tell us how one crafts a career toward leadership and not that everybody is going to do that there are reasons why and if they had ever tried to get a leadership position why they think it didn't work and we also asked the people who were leaders why do you think you got selected Give us some of the reasons that you felt were important. We then did interviews. In the Lord sample, there are theaters of different sizes, and we were alerted that size matters. <laughs> <laughs> In this election cycle, I don't even know if you can say that. <laughs> but we stratified the theaters in our sample into three different groups and interviewed leaders and people immediately below leadership in 24 of the theaters. And again, thank you for some of you who are in this room who gave us your time on the phone and were very generous. Um, of course, telephone interviews are not anonymous. You know, we're talking to another human being. And one of our panelists yesterday asked me if people said, well, this is off the record. And I had to think, we didn't have anybody say, well, I'll tell you this, but you can't ever repeat it to anybody. Because we made a very solemn promise of confidentiality. We didn't, we said that we will never talk about who you are by name or the theater you work with or use any identifying information in our report. And in fact, sometimes we weren't sure if people could extrapolate and guess who might have said what. We went back to our 30 people who were guiding us all along and said, can you tell who might have said this? They said, no. Okay, so people 
people really confided in us and we strongly hope that they feel we respected their confidentiality in what they shared with us. So we interviewed about 100 people. Um, Hour-long interviews. That's why it took a long time. So these are the key themes that came out of what all this massive information that we gathered. And Inika will come up and explain each one and what we found about each one of these topics. I'll turn it over to yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Lucinda. I always feel much quieter after she speaks. <laughs> so, after all that, I'm going to lower this data collection. Um, we did a lot of reading and rereading and coding and recoding. And these are the findings that we would like to share with you. And if you could keep in the back of your mind uh, as we uh, think through these, how each of these elements affect or can affect whether somebody, male, female, person of color or not, makes it to the top if that is what their uh, aspiration is. So we're going to start with uh, familiarity and trust. When we studied the career paths of the leaders in our sample, we found several trends that indicated how one group or another group was favored as they were uh, selected or considered for selection uh, by a board or a theater. We're going to look at each side, men and women, and we'll start on the men's side. As you saw in one of the slides before, because white men have been those leaders for many, many decades now, they have become the stereotype of what a leader looks like. So if you compare 68 versus 32%, that's a pretty big difference. So that image of what a leader is is pretty ingrained in our minds. That's a familiarity. It translates into trust. Who you trust can be a leader of your theater. And it seems to favor the men. This is how we learned about this. Here are a few quotes of how people talked about it. It's hard to imagine what you haven't seen. So if you don't see many women on the top, it's hard to imagine. And if you see white male leadership models in other areas, especially if you're a board member and you come from a corporate environment, and that's what you are going to imagine. That's what familiar is. What is familiar to you, that's what you will trust. Mm. Or what you are comfortable with, in the other quote. <coughs> Secondly, we found that there was a trust in potential that was also favoring men. And let me show you what that looked like. We looked at a very small number of theaters. In fact, the theaters that had a budget of over 10 million. Um, there are 23 of them, so we had an N, which is uh, a group of people. That's what you call it in research speak, an N of 23. And these 23 people were the EDs, so the executive or, or managing directors, the top operational manager of those 23 very, very wealthy theaters. And as we, uh, Sumer told you that we had the bios and resumes of these people, or we could look these things up online, we looked at where these people had been in the past. And what we found was that a much larger slice of men who were leading these theater theaters came to these large budget theaters from theaters that have a score or from organizations that have a much smaller budget. So 35% of the boards of these 23 theaters had actually trusted a man who had not been at that scale to do okay at that scale. But only 9% of those boards had trusted a woman to come from a lower budget to their 10 plus million higher budget. 
That is a statistically significant difference. And with a number of only 23 theaters, that difference is very, very strong. So, trust and potential. It's only from them. A third way that men have been uh, privileged uh, is by having founding experience. More men have founding experience as leaders in the uh, Lord on the artistic side, this is, than women. As you probably all know, founding a theater, you do everything. You do soup to nuts, right? That's what we say. You learn everything. Your skill set is the widest it could possibly be. That's an amazing, amazing skill. But among leaders in our Lord sample, that skill has currently only been recognized for men. For women, that has not, it, it has not bumped them up to the, um, the top level. So that's how men are favored in the selection process for leadership in our uh, sample. Let's look on the women's side. How are they favored in leadership? If a woman is an artistic, uh, excuse me, an associate artistic director in her theater, she makes a much larger chance to be promoted to artistic director than a man did. That difference, 40% versus 13% for men, that's again a statistically significant difference. So that's a powerful difference. So a woman, when she is very familiar, because she has held a position at the theater before, she makes a much larger chance to become the leader than the man does. So this is how we uh, heard about that. That quote that you see up there is from a board member who was part of a search committee uh, where a woman was promoted from associate artistic director to artistic director. And we saw that with other uh, women in our sample. This is where I have to stop, though, with what favors women. This is the only way that women in our sample are favored for the leadership. Now, this was our sample. So this was all of the regional samples in our theater. Let's look at how it works outside um, of uh, the Lord uh, theaters. So as Sumer mentioned, we did a survey with about 1,000 directors across the country. It's a very sizable number, and we were very happy with them. Thank you if you're here in the room, and you took our survey. What we learned is on this slide, is that among the women in our sample who were at the point when they took our survey, an artistic director, when, they when we asked them, how did you get to this position? More than half of them said, I started this theater. I am the founder <laughs> of this theater. More than half. That's again with the men, that's, that difference is again statistically significant. So women do not get selected. They have to make their own leadership spot. Remember when we talked about founding a theater, how for men founding a theater has been helping them to get you know, on that second step, how it's favoring them. Even though we have that many women founders, as we see here across the country, that founding experience has not been recognized yet as a really important, wonderful skill set of women across the country to make it to an artistic position within our sample theaters. So, here's our food for thought. If you're in the room, what can you do about this? Something's going on here, it's called the implicit bias. We talk about this in every, in every arena of our lives, right? You are all familiar with that. How can you learn about the implicit bias? You can do surveys, anonymous surveys, among all the employees of your theater, and ask about it. And if it's anonymous, people will speak up, but then please learn about it. Keep it in mind. The other thing, we've been talking about doing things fast and doing things slowly. If you do things more slowly, you pause and reflect. You can think about your decisions. You can reflect on your decisions and make sure they don't reflect any stereotypes or any elements of familiarity why you took a particular decision. 
You can give everybody equal chances. It's very easy to say, but think about the Rooney Rule. I'm sure you're all familiar with that. You know, in, in football, because there were so few general managers of color, well, pretty much all the players were people of color, they made it that they had to interview candidates of color. Think about that. You have to interview somebody you don't know yet as a person that you trust in that uh, uh, top spot. Do blind applications. The orchestra work uh, world did this with quite some success, and they really, really changed. Something to think about is to come up with industry-wide vetting criteria. It's not rocket science. There are things, there are competencies that leaders share with each other. Make a list of them, and make sure that you look at every applicant and compare them with that list. And please recognize founding experience. It seems to be something that women uh, have. All right, we're going to our <coughs> next topic, work-life balance. I don't think I have to draw a picture to you in this room of what theater life looks like. You, you, know, you can tell me more about it than I even know, so there are a few things up there that we, we did learn about. Um, so I'm not going to go into detail. Um, and we probably all do know that in this society, the burden of care, whether it's family or childcare, is still predominantly on women. So, knowing this from our lives and our research, we um, had built some questions into our surveys. You know, was this a barrier for you? What happened? Um, lo and behold, nobody actually checked off those <coughs> life balance issues on our survey. There were like maybe five people who talked about it. Same in our interviews, nobody brought up their work-life balance struggles. They didn't talk about it. And it became a conundrum for us. We said, what is going on? Because when we looked at blogs that you guys write on HowlRound, for example, <laughs> it's there. You talked about it. And we're like, why are they not talking to us about it? Because of this. <laughs> Because of this, we found that this is a taboo. There's silence about this topic. If there's silence about the topic, nobody can do something about it, right? We learn to not say anything. People do say about others, well, they may not be interested in leadership because they have families, meaning, you know, women. Um, but, so, we, when we talked to our informants, they, uh, inform us, yes, some of you are in this room, they say yes, you can't talk about it. These are some quotes about that. We are trained in our field to not bring it up because you won't get the job. I see somebody nodding. So here, uh, the other quote is about uh, somebody talking. They will not aspire for leadership because they have children. It's not about me, I don't have to deal with that. So, Food for thought. What can we do about it? Please talk about it. Not just for yourself, even if you're not dealing with it, it's going to level the playing field. This is the end result of all our conversations, is to level the playing field for ourselves, for our friends, family, and our children, and, our, and the future generations. We have to talk about it. Make policies, advertise those policies. Show that you are family friendly. There are models in other industries that we can adapt to the theater world. It's hard and it costs a lot of money, and somebody will talk about this later, but it should be possible. Start with objective criteria when you select, but once you do select, ask that person, what do you need? Ask everybody in your employee list, what do you need? Put it out there, and also talk about it. If you are the employee, talk about it with your leaders. Mentoring. I don't think I need to draw that picture either. Everybody we talked to said, talked about their mentors and how important they were for them on their path. I don't think this can be exaggerated or underestimated. So a mentor is somebody who has some clout, who will uh, talk about you and you know, raise your profile, connect you with others. And we, when we talked to women and people of color, they often said, I want to find a mentor who's like me. So reflect on who can be their mentor. If the leadership looks a particular way but doesn't look like you, that might be a barrier for you in order to actually get the mentoring you need in, um, to make it to the top. So it can be a disadvantage. 
here's how we've heard about this. You know, women looking for female mentors. People of color looking for, pe for other people of color who they can talk to about the struggles that they sometimes have, whether it's about childcare, whether it's about uh, racial tensions, whether it's about class issues, if, you know, if, if going to school is hard for you, or if, if doing that other unpaid internship is going to be hard for you, who can you talk to who, has, who looks like you, who has gone through there? More particularly, and I'm going to rush through this a little bit, uh, if you are a mentor in this room, and if you are mentoring an artist or a, an executive, these are the particular skills or the areas of mentorship that people who are aspiring for leadership are looking for. In our final report, which will be out uh, sometime this year, uh, you will get many, many more details about why these particular things are uh, important for people to, to learn. But you can see um, fundraising is there for everybody, directing widely beyond what um, beyond what who you look like. What we heard sometimes from people of color was, I'm asked to direct the playwright of color play, but I'm not asked to direct Shakespeare. I need to direct Shakespeare as well, or in other classes. So those are the particular skills that um, <coughs> those aspiring leaders need. So here's a little bit more food of, uh, for thought. Please promote others. Please promote others with search firms, uh, with board members on your own or another theater. Talk about their strengths. <laughs> <laughs> Invite those aspiring leaders to be exposed to other departments in your uh, in your theater, sometimes it can be very hard, you know, because departments can be siloed. Take them to board meetings. Let them see what goes on there. Let them learn. Let them learn every step of the way. Do that fundraising. Involve them in that fundraising, and talk about career development. Sometimes people have told us it really is unclear to me what a career path looks like in, in this uh, in, the, in this industry. So talk about. It. This is a very dull subject. Affordability, right? Um, I don't think I ever knew about any field where so many people talked about unpaid internship or no pay. It is absolutely stunning, but it speaks to your passion, right? So, um, as you can see in those quotes, it's hard to afford a theater life. Um, but if we want to move toward diversity, we're going to have to address the financial burden uh, of career development for aspiring leaders. Um, graduate school, it's hard to attain sometimes. It's not cheap, although there are many, many um, uh, supports for that. Uh, but it's not straightforward sometimes. So affordability is important. So very, very quickly, think about creating. And there are already wonderful training programs, but they need to be expanded. More people are interested. More people need that um, need that support. Master's programs are amazing. They don't just teach you skills, but they put you in contact with lots and lots and lots of people. So those are the elements that those uh, training uh, programs could pick up. And then you have to kind of start questioning that not getting paid for what you do. You know, please question that. I know it's not easy, um, and we all probably do it, but as an industry, we need to start addressing that. This is my last slide, and I always feel I want to pause here, and let's read that quote. The worst thing any artistic, any artist of color could do right now would be take an artistic directorship at an institution that is not a good fit and fail. Because every failure for one is one that everyone pays for for 10 years. That was a very, very powerful statement for us. So this is about culture fit, right? This is about a predominant culture and a non-predominant culture trying to work together. When you try to get to that culture fit, you have to put yourself on the same level. It takes a lot of work. That's work that needs to be done prior to bringing a person into a situation where they could possibly fail because the culture is not ready for them. because otherwise they will not be seen as holding that formal authority. So both in the training, give people formal authority, even if they're not part of your dominant culture. Make them seen, and then 
your theater to be ready for the next step. Thank you. of leadership. What should leadership in theaters look like? Is the model that we have right now the best way to prepare for tomorrow? There is new work coming out, say, from the Hilda Foundation that says young people today are not so interested in a pyramid structure. They like shared leadership. They want to have a voice, even if they haven't according to the people who have been in the field a long time, paid their dues yet. They have ideas. They went to school. They did internships. They want to have their say. So you want to hold on to the next generation of bright idea people? We may be needing to think about leadership in a different way. And leadership is much more relational as it is practiced. And it needs to be recognized as an important competency. How you relate to people, not just your board, not just your audience, but to your staff and to your art. And all the research that I've done, all the research that I have read, says that women in this society have a lot more relational skills than men. We're sort of socialized that way. I don't think that there is a gene connected to some chromosome about relationships, but we're brought up to relate, and that needs to be recognized as an important competency. And this notion about entitlement. People who've been in this job for a number of years have paid their dues and expect others coming up through unpaid internships and low-paying jobs working up their field to, you know, bide their time, bide their time, learn, learn, and then maybe speak. I don't know. Uh, my children speak up. What do they know? Well, they know some things. They have some good ideas. And I know that Carrie talks to her daughter and gets ideas from them. We may be shutting ourselves off from what works in the 21st century if we keep to this old time idea that, you know, with experience will come wisdom. There's some experience that's right out there, and I see young faces in the crowd, which makes me feel wonderful. <laughs> Another issue for the future is to address board development and philanthropy. <coughs> the current leaders in philanthropy came of age when art education was part of the educational system. It's not there now. Art is not part of the three R's that the testing-based educational system is focusing on. The next generation of philanthropists who will be filling these board seats don't really have an idea what makes an art organization survive and thrive. So. Going forward, board development is going to be a very important topic. And after all, audience development is where it's at. And I give myself as an example of, you know, I'm one of the examples. I have subscriptions in many theaters. My children don't, even though I started taking them at a young age. Maybe too young, I don't know. <laughs> well, I'm not the only one who failed. The audience has got to change. You know, I, I will be soon not going to the theater anymore because I won't be alive that much longer. <laughs> so who's going to replace me? 
and we need to think about the audience in a much more wide and wise way. And one of the wonderful things we heard in our interviews was that artists of color, be they in next in line position or in leadership positions, had done the most work in bringing in cultivating audiences that are much wider than the present crowd of subscribers. And that's a talent that should not be overlooked. These are the topics that we leave you with as further questions. And anything that we touch on, you have ideas of how to improve what's going on in the world of theater. Please contact us. What we present today is a work in progress. Every time we talk in a public forum, we look to get feedback. And if you follow our work, you will hear and see yourself incorporated into what we present. So we, it's a joint project. Let us know how we can improve what we put out today and we will work together to make it all better. <laughs>
I've had many mentors, some are sitting in the audience today, uh, but for the sake of this discussion, I'll um, be speaking about uh, two mentors, two mentorship opportunities that weren't just mentors, but were um, sponsorships. Um, and these were places where uh, my mentor opened the door, didn't just mentor, but sponsored me up. Uh, and that was uh, Sheldon Epps, artistic director at the Pasadena Playhouse, with whom I had begun a, what I call, drive-by mentorship in 2011, where I'd meet with him once a quarter, and he then hired me in 2014 as his associate artistic director. And then Molly Smith, artistic director at Arena Stage, who, with whom I had a formalized mentorship through the incredible TCG Leadership U grant opportunity, and uh, who recently hired me as deputy artistic director at Arena Stage. So as I reflect on those two um, mentorship turned sponsorship opportunities, a lot of times people ask me, um, how do you, how'd you get that job? <laughs> and, um, because in neither of these cases did I ask them for a, a job. Um, they called me up with the opportunity, but that's because we had this robust mentorship in place. So I've been trying to think about and dissect those mentorships and I, I've come up with sort of three commonalities of them uh, that led to this sponsorship opportunity. Um, the first is uh, timing. That what, with both of these individuals, when, when we met, when we entered into a mentorship together, um, they were ready in their careers to be tremendous mentors and to create space. Um, and then I was also ready to be mentored I had already founded a company and spent many years trying to prove, prove, prove myself. I was ready to improve. So the timing was right uh, in both of those cases. The second thing was um, mutuality in these mentorships. Uh, and what I mean by that is while the mentorship may have started with a mentor and mentee, over time it shifted and um, we became peers. Um, and I'll maybe share one story. Uh, through, through the Leadership U opportunity at TCG while I was at Arena Stage, um, well, one of the questions that was on my mind that I told Molly was, to Lord or not to Lord? That was the question. <laughs> that I had, a, had founded a theater company. I was wondering, do I want to stay at my theater company or do I want to shift to a Lord? Underneath that question was, do I have anything to offer a Lord? And would I feel could I survive in a Lord structure? So um, at my uh, theater company I had founded, we had created a couple of um, methodologies. Uh, consensus organizing for theater, which is an artistic methodology uh, rooted in community organizing and audience uh, development. Uh, and the Green Theater Choices Toolkit, which was about greening our theater industry. So in my mentorship with Molly, I said I wanted to test these out and see if they can live in a Lord structure. So she sponsored me into a meeting with Edgar, the executive director. We presented these ideas. He said, oh, what a great idea. They sponsored me into senior staff. We presented these ideas. They then sponsored me into their own departments, um, which gave me the, the space to be able to test out these ideas. The conclusions we came to together um, were that, um, yes, uh, to Lord, <laughs> that um, I had something to offer a Lord, and I could find a way to navigate a complex organization, though I was coming from a small organization I had founded. Um, so that's what I mean about mutuality. I had something to offer in these mentorships that shifted the power dynamic. Mm -hmm. um, the third commonality that I've identified is, uh, in these mentorships was vulnerability. Um, that with both these mentors, I was able to be um, openly self-critical about my own work safely. And I'll share one story. Um, in my drive by mentorships with Sheldon Epps, I would drive up from San Diego once a quarter. We'd have lunch, and I'd talk about what was going on at Mo'olelo Performing Arts Company. He'd talk about what's going on at Pasadena Playhouse. And these were very nice gatherings. But I remember after about, I think it might have been the third one, he, said, he asked me, how's it going? And I said, you know, I just uh, completed a production and it really didn't go as well as I would have liked it to go. 
And he said, why? And I said, well, I was thinking about the rehearsal room, and I think maybe I micromanaged uh, my lead actor. I saw him, sitting across from me in lunch, shift from leaning back to leaning forward. And he said, okay, let's talk more about that. And we started dissecting this, and all of a sudden we became two artists who are peers, um, willing to be vulnerable with one another about our work. And I felt that as a tremendous turning point in our relationship. So as I reflect on the research through this lens of mentorship, uh, for me, again, these mentorships have then turned into sponsorships. The commonalities were the right time, a sense of mutuality, and vulnerability, safe vulnerability. So that's it. Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Shay Fermezo, but my mom calls me Stephanie, so <laughs> may explain a bit why I'm up here today. <laughs> um, I've been asked to respond to the research through the lens of intersectionality um, and the complexity of diversity. Um, so intersectionality that, that holds that no singular experience of identity is, is mm -hmm. Sums up an entire person. Um, so, when I looked at the research, um, I was really pleased to see that the researchers included this concept pretty fundamentally in the work that's being done in terms of gender parity can't be disassociated or uncoupled with other forms of uh, multiple and simultaneous uh, discrimination. So, uh, the, there's a couple, I, I helped to develop this pro project and do early fundraising for it, and there was a consensus in, in the field that um, this issue of gender parity was not as important as other diversity issues at the moment, which was very disheartening to me, as I assure it is to everybody. Um, because I think the gender parity movement and women's equality has been asked to step back so many times. Um, and I have faced personally where there have been certain types of minority positions that have been, uh, minority positions that have been put in, in a hierarchy of importance, which I think is just not useful to anybody and doesn't promote genuine, authentic uh, inclu uh, inclusion and equity. So what I, what I take from this um, is that with all of these steps that we can, that we can make to uh, improve uh, the day-to-day -day circumstances that would make gender parity possible, we also need to uh, parallel that with examination of what bias and unconscious bias is. So in my particular perspective, I've been very privileged to have the uh, career that I have, to have been given opportunities that I have, which is ultimately and completely tied to my education, my socioeconomic status, um, and circumstances of my birth. I acknowledge that, but um, not all women look the same, is what I want to say. Womanhood is not a singular experience. and. And to that also, um, gender in the 21st century is a different complexity than it was in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. So that I believe firmly that fight for, uh, that feminism is not about preferencing one gender over another. It's about eliminating discrimination based on gender and gender presentation. It does not match. Mm -hmm. Um, so since identity is so complex and it can't all be tackled at once, and diversity is equally complex, we do have to take steps towards um, rectifying systematization of oppression and discrimination. But I would challenge us all, as an industry and as individuals, to recognize that we all have unconscious biases 
and conscious biases, and while we are putting systems in place to make the field more equitable, uh, that we understand and sort of examine why or how we can say, I trust you even if you don't look like me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, wow, I um, I used to be afraid of numbers as a kid, and uh, when I came across statistical analyses and data reports, I found that they could be complex and heavy, but summaries and recommendations are what I always be holding on to. Um, what excited me most about uh, this report were the recommendations, because I had been experiencing firsthand some things in motion at the inside of an institution like TCG, but um, also seeing that there's clearly so much more work to be had. Yeah. I'm going to share two points from the study that were particularly resonant with me as I, as I think about my own journey to this point. One, familiarity and trust in potential. Hmm. What a theater leader needs to look like, white and male, because white and male leaders have been the long-standing majority in top positions. Uh, before TCG, for many years, I, I worked with a very small and nimble, yet fierce art service organization dedicated to strengthening the Asian American arts and cultural workers uh, in New York City. I received calls with folks who had brilliant Asian ideas, um, Asian director for traditional performances as part of Diversity Day for a corporation made up primarily of white men <laughs> calling upon the small Asian arts group and I, as an Asian woman, was ready to deliver and that was where I was placed to be of use. Um, there are a lot of folks striving for diversity but are we asking the right questions and who are we asking and I think that this report really really hits the nail on the head in many ways. And I had many questions back then and I, and I definitely still do now, particularly around intersectionality. Um, I'd see lots of women on stage and wonder where are the women of color on stage and how about women of color in leadership positions in the theater off stage? On my personal path to leadership roles, I had, I learned that I had to be nimble with what I had. When I didn't see myself in spaces, I tried to create my own pathway to access and look to community. I, I looked to folks who understood and were invested in making change beyond just diversity for the sake of looking like the next big thing or something that was cool. Right. I have so much respect for, respect for folks continuing to do the work, the very important work on the grassroots level to serve the community, but um, you know, this report really goes to show that there needs to be a balance in representation on a much larger scale, and I, I quickly saw that this wasn't going to happen with me hoping and praying that folks were going to see me beyond just being an Asian American and a woman, but that folks should be able to see me as those things, and then some. Two, culture fit. Mm. Sounds kind of trendy, but. Uh, <laughs> now, what to do once someone is diversifying a larger institution, or rather, what systems are in place to really thoughtfully support diversifying leadership? You know, uh, whether I like it or not, I. I've been socialized one way or the other to read the male experience as uh, this kind of universal experience, mm. That's something that we should hope to measure to, and it, and it gets really dangerous when a theater's culture gets so used to this climate. So, you know, the culture fit point in the report was particularly interesting because, yes, it reminded me of the times I'd get calls almost randomly for Asian musicians quite out of context to plug into a corporation absent of diversity for this kind of quick plug and play version. Uh, and my own questions about large scale institutions, even like TCG, I had heard about um, before being able to proudly call this place a true culture striving to work towards change. 
Uh, I do want to share also that unlike many reports that I've reviewed in the Wellesley study, it was very heartening though to see such thoughtful recommendations laid out, but also knowing that this work has started already at so many different places and it's going to take so much time. Uh, particularly on the section of what individual theaters and service organizations do, I was really happy to see that um, you know there were so many things that TCG was hitting, ranging from correcting instances of gender and racial bias, opening up conversations in the context of different programs, creating opportunities, but, but that's just one institution when this report covers so many theaters. Um, so just to share on an institutional end, um, some of the things that TCG is currently doing to, to hit things on the gender parity note, um, a lot of our major decisions are focused around this. Grant making publications, um, choosing speakers for conferences, American theater and our continued research on gender parity, at the intersection sections within our national conferences on gender parity. And this is the key, I think, for, for TCG. We have sessions like men for gender justice sessions. You know, I think it's important for women to support women, but male allies are, are just as important in different cases. Um, uh, another thing for TCG in particular, uh, through the work of the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Institute, is thinking beyond gender binary, particularly in building analysis um, including trans and gender non-conforming identities. I think that's really key. So, I mean, to summarize, I mean, there's, there's a lot of things going on in the works within the institution. I wanted to share a little bit about um, my personal point of view. And, you know, as a late stage millennial, if, if you will, <laughs> have the privilege of being able to be in this room with folks from different unique journeys, you know, it's easy to feel at ease with you know, a lot of groundbreaking milestones for women, particularly in the media, but, but I'm not satisfied, and I, I don't think that we should be, especially with recognized support. Yeah. So anyway, um, you know, thanks again, uh, Carrie and Erin and Bethany and, and the team at Wellesley for, for this, because it's, it's definitely a start, and there's going to be a lot of pushback, and hopefully, <laughs> The pushback, yes. Um, hopefully, we can, you know, pull from some of the findings here and work together as as a community. Um, it, it's not about pointing fingers. It's really about, hey, there's something going on here, and it's 2016, and 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 I am in my 30s, my early 30s, and yes, I'm still aspiring, but you know, I want to look towards the future and and not just hope that things are going to change, but work with folks to actually make change. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm uh, Annie Kaufman. I'm a freelance director um, and a board member of SDC. I live in New York City. And um, I agree that I, I also read the, um, the report over and over again, but sitting in this room with all of you and hearing you guys sort of go through it live has sort of sent my, you know, sent me a little bit reeling. And I, I feel like there's um, something that you guys brought up that, that sort of, I'm, I'm sort of like shifting what I was going to talk about, so this might be a little um, all over the place, so I apologize for that. Um, well, first of all, I just want to say, uh, you know, Zelda's name has been brought up several times uh, today, and um, what's lovely about being in this room with all, all of you is I don't really know many of you. So um, the story that I'm about to tell, I, I, I've told a lot of people, but not to you guys. So, <laughs> um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this. I, I'm a little bit late to the, the party about being uh, outraged at the uh, statistics of uh, women in the theater. Um, and one of the reasons that is, is when I came, when I graduated from UCSD, I got my MFA there directing, and I returned to New York City, and I had an interview with Zelda. I was supposed to, I was interviewing for um, a job with MFA uh, actors doing um, a Shaw piece. And, um, and she took me through, you know, this interview, and at one point she asked me, she said, so you know, how's it going? How's it going now that you're back from graduate school? And um, I said, yeah, no, it's okay, it's hard. Um, it's hard being a woman director. 
And she just looked at me. And she said, what? <laughs> and I said, you know, it's like being a woman direct director. And she's like, well, um, and, uh, <laughs> you know, and I felt like I didn't get the job, <laughs> okay? I did not get the job. Um, but I thought the, the sort of takeaway for me at that point was, wow, right, I, um, I, I'm talking to this woman who's basically responsible for a uh, regional theater and the nonprofit movement. Um, so she started in, what, the 50s, you know, at a time when all sorts of things were against us and more, you know. Um, and I think she even translated Russian documents in the World War II, okay? So this is a woman who, like, um, and here I am, a, you know, a debutante from Phoenix, Arizona, coming, you know, saying this to her. So anyway, um, I learned, I thought, okay, this is a great lesson. I'm going to put my head down, and I'm going to do my work, and I'm not going to talk about being a woman. And I'm going to, um, and hopefully recognition and jobs will come because of my good work, etc. So I did, I put my head down, and um, I did my work, and yeah, I mean, you know, it worked. Uh, it worked for a while, and then I lifted my head, uh, you know, up from the grindstone a few years ago, and looked around and thought, like, here I am, still here I am in this position, and um, because I had my nose to the grindstone for so long, I didn't realize that, you know, everyone else had sort of a day. A dance, um, people of not my gender. So, um, and so I thought to myself, right, is this crazy that Zelda Fitzchandler basically built the house, right, that we're all living in, and we are not running it yet. <laughs> I mean, we are not actually, and there are rooms that I'm not even allowed into, and there are rooms that I don't even know exist. Um, there are opportunities that I don't even know exist. Um, so, uh, so that was a sort of wake up call to me. Um, anyway, so I'm here sort of talking about, uh, I think, I think all alternative um, definitions of leadership because I, for one, and I've had many conversations uh, with the people up here, and um, I don't want to be an artistic director um, of, a, of, a, of a lower theater, of any theater at the moment. Um, it, it's frightening to me, it, or frightening, is, I, I feel, it feels claustrophobic to me. And, um, I, I, you know, to be sort of tied to a, to a theater. Um, I really love my, my freelance um, life. It's a hard life, but um, I do, I like my freedom. Um, and so I ask myself, what is leadership then? What, is, what does leadership look like then in this, uh, you know, if, if it's not to be a leader of, of a theater? Um, and I've been pondering this uh, for the past few years, and uh, I think a leader, is someone who takes responsibility for a community, for their betterment, for their well-being, um, and for the cultivation, right? So that doesn't that that can mean many many things. Um, and around that time, I joined uh, the SDC board, um, and uh, and with the amazing leadership of Laura Penn, whom we've already mentioned today. Uh, that is an organization for directors and choreographers. Or basically, it's basically like a grassroots activist organization helping directors with um, visibility and diversity and promotion. Um, and I know it sounds crazy, but uh, directors in this country have a very different kind of uh, recognition than they do in other countries. Um, this is a playwrights uh, 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 nation, and it should be. Playwrights are incredibly important, but I think that, you know, we, uh, we are also artists in our own right. So that is something that we are promoting. And something that um, you guys were talking about in terms of leadership and the kind of um, uh, mystery surrounding how does one become a leader in this, you know, in, in this field. And I think that the part of the issue um, in the theater is we're so, uh, we're so in love with our own mystery and we're so in love with the, you know, protecting the rehearsal room the magic that happens in the rehearsal room and no one's allowed in. And, and so I think that's kind of extended to the practices of, of how, how we, you know, rise to leadership or what leadership means, et cetera. And so I think by being part of the SDC, um, what I'm sort of interested in and what SDC I think is interested in is, it, is sort of um, making transparent what it is that we do, that it's not a, you know, it's not a secret society, um, that, you know, that art, that we are artists, and that is, you know, I don't know, 
special or whatever, but let's not also <laughs> let's also not um, overuse that term in a way that cuts us off from um, transparency. Uh, and that goes and that's with everything, with um, identity and with um, diversity, etc. So I think that's uh, that is that is the form of leadership that I am taking at this at, at this moment. All right. I am an actress and a director and a teacher of acting and also I'm Michelle Shea <laughs> and also a healer and, and I'm including that because I got a Fox Foundation grant to study the connection between healing and acting for the purpose of knowing more than just falling into the power of what we do, I wanted to know what was it energetically that could uh, allow me as a performer, us as a performer, to connect more deeply with the hearts of the audience, because for me, being an artist, especially an artist of color, had to do with people seeing each other in ways they could not see each other in 9 to 5 reality, and hopefully uh, dissolving some of the issues that separate us from the huge humanity that we're all a part of. And I firmly believe in what we do as a, uh, an amazing place to research what it means to be human and to, through telling the stories that we, we live out of and creating meaning together, we confront in a community as an audience, the questions that face us about the phenomenon of being alive. And within this construct, um, it made me study many things and it invited me to many opportunities, one of which was to work as a leadership presence coach in a five-year program at Goddard Space Center at NASA for leadership development called Leadership Alchemy, which put me in the cauldron of what it means to be a leader when, of course, I wasn't thinking of myself that way. Mm -hmm. However, what was at stake for the scientists and engineers there was um, being able to make such an impact that they could get lots of money to do things to save our planet and to explore space. So there was a lot at stake. And so I feel that the time that we're in right now, there is a lot at stake for us as a theater community because in the future, what theater is going to be is definitely not going to be like it was. Mm. Something else wants to come forth. Wow. Something else wants to be born. And we're in the question of what that is. We don't know what it is. But one thing that definitely is not going on the door is inclusion for everybody. Okay. And we don't know what that means. And we do have to, we live in, uh, as I've been contemplating all this, in a, uh, a world duality meeting. You know, the protagonist and antagonist exist at the same time. So somehow we have to make friends with what is in a way that doesn't drive us crazy. Huh. So in this thing called culture that we talk about, we forget that we made it up. <laughs> it's the way we do things. And at one time, a couple of people got together and said, you know, this is a problem here. Let's do X, Y, or Z. Somebody else agreed, and then it became a culture, a family, a tribe, and eventually an institution that at one point was alive. Like all of Lort was an answer to problems. Yes. Then they became institutions, yes. which were buildings that got stuck in practices and ways of thinking, et cetera. Mm -hmm. and then it's a thing versus the people that are in it. And so part of our issue, I think, is finding where the real responsibility or the cause of the problem is. We can't find it because it's embedded in the networks of conversations we've developed. Mm -hmm. Both the um, 
recognize conversations, and most importantly, um, the web of deep emotional, I don't know what, garbage <laughs> from, the, <laughs> from the private conversations we hold about each other and what's going on that we don't know what to do with. So this is what I'm hoping will change for us uh, during this research because to me, uh, we're at such an amazing place as human beings when we, we have the question of who are we beyond gender? And who are we within gender in terms of, for me I find, uh, I'm still trying to step into the power of being a woman, mm. all of it, and let go of all the programming about how dangerous, dangerous it is to do that. Mm. But, uh, and I, I believe that there, what's exciting about, I'm going to call it the feminine versus feminine, is the principle of femininity. There is an aspect of irresistibility that's in it, that uh, how that's packaged, we can, uh, we can each explore in a way that I hope will soften the resistance that you inevitably will face anytime you're trying to do something different. That uh, antagonist is there in any sector, anywhere, that's what I recognize now. But what we have is something that's so alive in theater that um, we have the potential through what we do on these little spaces to really cause something amazing to happen. And that leadership can happen from any place because anybody can be called at some point to be to take center stage, and the question is, what are you going to do with it? What are you going to do? Mm -hmm. And my grandmother said, don't be in the world and in the way. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> and my good friend Alvin, a classic dra drag queen that's gone on, she said, girl, don't wear, don't let that dress wear you, you wear the dress. <laughs> <laughs> and these are people that have taken me uh, along the way. I had to make my own way to theater. I made my life myself. I love theater. I think everyone, Carrie, Aaron, I thank everybody for having me here, Michelle, you know, I adore you. I've learned so much. I'm so glad to be a part of this, but I am a, uh, a high plains drifter. <laughs> I do my own thing. I got hired by the uh, California Arts Council to go into the jails and teach aerobics, because again, they wanted a color girl to dance. <laughs> but I went into the jails and I was amazed that there were so many black and brown women in jail. Right down to one young lady said, Miss Jones, Miss Jones, you remember me, Miss Jones? And it was one of my daughter's friends from middle school. And my daughter and I were wondering, we worked for an actor to this girl. And I said, well, what, what are you doing here? She said, you know how it is. I said, no, I don't know how it is. Tell me how it is. And they weren't interested in aerobics, but they were interested in storytelling. I met a young white woman who was back in jail. Fabulous, a little stud about me, just a fabulous body, fierce little, little woman. And she proceeds to tell us about betrayal. And she says, you know, my girlfriend promised that she'd wait for me and I would do the five years for Daily Dope. And then we'd, we had money and we would hang out together, we would be together. But I came home and my girlfriend set me up mm -hmm. with boys from high school. I went to this abandoned Victorian in the hate, she says. And uh, my girlfriend never showed up. And the guys were waiting for me upstairs in this house that was being renovated. And uh, they decided to get a place to play poker. And she said, I knew I was it. And they're all looking at me with wolves' eyes. And she said, I, I thought, OK, I'm going to take off my pants, but I'm going to leave my boots on, I'm going to leave my underwear on, and I'm going to leave my t-shirt on. And they're playing. She's uh, getting undressed. But there's a bag of cocaine and money on the table. This girl, Tanya, wherever you are, bless you. She says, I'm watching that money. And by now, I am like so pissed off at the world and at love and at my girlfriend. She said that there was a moment in time that said, it's now or never. She said, I snatched the money. And I started running. And I jumped over the railing. And she's, she can't breathe now. She's like, and, and we're at 850 Bryant Street. And she said, and, and I ran out to the streets. And there was a lady that nearly hit me. And I told the lady, I said, those guys are chasing me. She said, Miss Jones, I was holding on to the money and the, and the cocaine. And then she said it was a lady that took me to Daly City, away from there. And the women around, all these black and brown women around her, and I'm saying, catch her, catch her, catch her. Because she was falling. She couldn't breathe. She said, and I, and I, and I, and I, and I, and we lifted her. And I said, you live to tell the story. The Medea Project is my contribution to theater, because I think it's time, as Michelle was saying, that we're building something else. Something else is coming. And I find that incarcerated women, what they need is the freedom of voice to say where they've been, because baby, you want drama. Mm. <laughs> you want drama. I met a young woman in prison, in jail, who killed her baby in a cocaine hallucination. And the, the Medea Project's name grew out of that because she said, my husband wanted me gone. Because she like, I got really addicted to coke and he could do coke all weekend and then go to work. But I was out every day looking for more coke. And I started to study about tolerance in women and men and drugs. And this young lady, uh, he, her husband said, I want you gone. You're, you're a junkie. I want you gone. The corner, the corner don't want you. And she said, oh, really? You want me gone? He said, all I want out of, excuse my language, all I want out of this motherfucker is my baby. I want you gone. And she said, really? And she said, he went to bed. She said, and I smothered my baby. 
I smothered that baby because that's what I could do. And I'm thinking, Medea, you know? I mean, it's like, whoa, this is Medea, the highest order. And so she would say to me, I'm, I'm not going to the gym. I'm waiting to die. I'm going to heaven because only God can judge me. And the story started happening. Women started telling these amazing stories about survival. And they didn't know. They were, the, the stories were driven in shame and sorrow. And they were just so embarrassed that they had failed the system. I said, you failed a system that was not of your design. And as I sat here this morning, listen to men versus women in legitimate theater. It's the same old bullshit. <laughs> and I, I think about, as I thought about, yes, darling, you're the baby. Baby's lovely. She's talking back. <laughs> I think about how to close all of this. And I wanted to ask you to help me participate. John, the ghost in this place. Um, I wanted to about how could we close this session? And I want to say that I've been doing this now for almost 50 years, theater with incarcerated women. I've been doing theater around the world. I have a theater company in Africa, Medea in Africa. I am uh, working with UC Medical Center as an artist, working with women who are dealing with trauma and living with HIV. And it's something called performance as medicine. Mm. And it's been an amazing situation with the hospital, with the clinic, for them to watch our performances. A young woman, uh, Bianca uh, Henry, wrote The Ugly Duckling. I asked her to translate The Ugly Duckling from your story, and that's what you just experienced. Duck all fucked up in time. Yeah. <laughs> and these are methodologies that I developed. I, but I bring in the myth because the myth is something that we all understand. It's, it's the universal language, is it not? Talk to me, is it not? Yes. And it's the place where I think we intersect with our artist social change, with classic theater. I'm, going, I'm about to go on the road with two of my uh, performers. One who's living with HIV and the other who's been with me for 20 years. She was a former meth addict. But we're going to Rutgers, we're going to Princeton, and we're going to Howard to work with uh, uh, classical literature. With these women are going to go in and teach theater artists uh, uh, their, from their standpoint, what is classical literature? Mm -hmm. And I, I applaud these schools because they sent for us. Because it's time. We're building something else here. And women uh, sit at the center of so much, whether we like it or not. And women, we have to get with it. Okay? I was at a, I was at a, um, I was at a meeting with um, Alicia Garza in February at Hamilton College. And everybody wanted to talk about, uh, well, you know, she talked, She was about to begin a, a thing on Black Lives Matter, but everybody wanted to talk about what happened to Huey P. Newton and why he turned out to be such a drug addict and blah, 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 blah. And then everybody went on to ask her, well, what do you do about self-care? And she said, I'm not interested in self-care. I'm interested in collective care. And that, I think that includes all of us. Collective care. It's about me wanting to know, how are you doing? How are you doing? If we're trying to do this theater thing, we need to come in. If, you don't, if you're not looking so good, girl, I want to be say, go home. <laughs> we got this. <laughs> and I'd like for you to just help me end this with um, a piece that we wrote. A young woman named Bianca Robinson was in my first group at the, at the county jail. And Bianca Robinson's daughter was killed in a car at a car in the Tenderloin while Bianca was in jail for prostitution. And Bianca lost it. She was howling, Medea. She's howling in this solitary confinement. Her baby has just been blown away. And she says, they gotta let me go home. I said, she said, Miss Jones, they have, I said, they have to let you do nothing. They put you in lockdown because they're afraid that you will hurt yourself or somebody else. And the rest of us talked about what, what's going on here. And we wrote a piece as a group entitled, Nobody Told Her. And I think it resonates with today. So if every time I say nobody told her, you say nobody. Ready? Mm -hmm. Ready. Nobody told her. Nobody. Now she can't believe it when it's said. Nobody. Born behind the eight ball, nobody. life's a house of cards. Everything's fine as long as there's no wind. 
Nobody told her. Nobody. Nobody told her. Nobody. That it would all be blown away. Her house, her money, her children, her love, her life. Nobody told her. Nobody. That the one waiting on the street corner in that alleyway, in that hotel room, nobody told her. Nobody. That she's the one who loses it all. Nobody told her that not much was expected of her. You got it. <laughs> and therefore she doesn't have to hope for much. Nobody told her Nobody. that she's getting on that train, in that car, and she's caught in the traffic. And what is this destination? West Highway, Ellison Taylor, Cap Street, Subic Bay. Nobody told her. Nobody. Nobody told her nobody. that while doing time for prostitution, trying to get enough money to feed her baby, nobody told her. Nobody, nobody told her. Nobody, nobody told her nobody. that her baby's brains would be splattered on the back seat of a car in the tenderloin. Nobody told her. Nobody, nobody told her. Nobody. So how in the hell could she know? Nobody told her. Nobody. Thank you very much. We are not represented. All right, now, uh, two weeks ago, Hilda Solis, a Latina, basically changed the face of the Music Center Board. It's 50% now people of color. Hilda Solis, a woman, a woman of color. And now there's two plays, uh, Latino, people of color, in the season. I don't think that's ever happened before. So as we go into the sessions, I, don't, I think we can't forget this is a nonprofit. We are paying taxes. We are going to be the majority people of color within the next 20 years. So as a strategy for, for moving forward, I'm very pragmatic. <laughs> uh, I think that would be a great strategy to discuss before they're here today. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Mia Thirada. I'm an actress and writer. Thank you for holding this space um, for all of us. I think one of the things that stood out to me was the notion of having to earn your space. Um, and I feel like, um, as an actor and writer, 
it's very interesting where you can get your stories from, but when you want to share it, the question that people ask is, have you been a playwright? Which, in my case, as an actor, I had to write my own monologues to give voice to the things I wanted to say. So in many ways, I felt like that's me writing. However, I'm not in a formal program, which I felt was very limiting in the way people saw who can write plays and content that could be for theater. The other thing, as Ms. Um, Rodessa Jones just shared, um, I'm from New York. Recently, I lived in Los Angeles the last two years. I moved to the Bay three months ago. The interesting thing is that in LA, the place I felt most comfortable is Skid Row. It wasn't theater. It wasn't anywhere else, because that's where the stories were. That's where the vulnerability is. So as far as experience and who gets to tell stories, there are so many people in those communities who are homeless, who are artists, who are individuals with stories, but oftentimes aren't given the space to share them. So I think in some of the change, I mean, some of, as you know, part of the younger generation, I guess, of this movement is being inclusive on where you seek the talent mm -hmm. that can potentially have the content mm -hmm. to bring in the audiences. Because our there's a lot of people, friends of mine, where we're more interested. I want you to say this for your breakout session. Okay, no, no, no. I'm just saying, just looking for where inclusion and where that, um, where the stories can come from versus what looks good on the resume and what's quantifiable, because that doesn't always bring in the new stories. Thank you. Thank you. Say your juice. Just throw out your right. Yeah. So my name is Layla Moran Buster. I'm a former board member for the Playwright Center of San Francisco, former executive director for one of the West Productions, and soon to be announced artistic director for another theater company. Hey. So, um, I'm speaking from the experience of smaller theaters, which in this community there are hundreds of us, and we are struggling a lot. So my four thoughts that I had quickly were cost of being in leadership in a small theater company means paying out of pocket. So a lot of us that are in those leadership positions, we pay hundreds, thousands of dollars into making our productions happen because we don't get funding. Um, the second thing that I want to talk about was peer mentorship. So there aren't a lot of opportunities for those mentorship. I find that in a lot of ways we end up finding peer mentors. So you're learning as you go. And I think that that's an important aspect of mentorship. And then the second thing was that, um, though I'm not a founder, in those smaller theater companies, that skill set is still there. Doing everything from marketing and website development, through fundraising, through everything. So I'd just like those things to also be discussed. And then the last thing was, I just, it's a comment slash question. Um, in terms of personal familiarity, where we're talking about that was the one area that women had advantage. One of the quotes up there said that it cited, well, because of recommendations, et cetera, et cetera. In the converse of that, does that mean that the men had less favorable recommendations? Yeah. <laughs> Thank Good you. question. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Emily Murase. I work for Mayor Ed Lee as head of the San Francisco Department of the Status of Women. Woo! And this is but the issues are not, and I just wanted to offer two potential resources. One is we've created the San Francisco Gender Equality Principles Initiative. We've talked to architects, we've talked to advertising creative directors. The issues are very similar. So it's at www.genderprinciples.org with very granular level interventions that folks might want to think about. Secondly, one strategy that we found very successful is to throw down a challenge to major corporations to increase the number of women in leadership all throughout the corporation to adopt some of these granular level uh, uh, interventions. So I recommend that as a potential strategy. Thank, Thank you for coming. Thank you. On the lines of potential strategy, my name is Kristen Vangenhoven. I'm the artistic director of Wham Theater in the beautiful Berkshires of Western Massachusetts, one of those founders who does everything. And uh, as this idea has been brewing over the last few days that I've been talking about with a few people, in order to reframe the future of leadership, I think a Leadership Institute Summit is in order. So I think uh, we should keep our eyes open, you should all keep your eyes open, for something that really addresses the nuts and bolts of the skills that have been addressed in this report as a beginning, as a next strategy, as an action move. Uh, as a Berkshire Leadership Summit for Aspiring Women Leaders. So I put it out there, so now I'll make it happen. Woo! Thank you. Hi, um, I want to say
second that about skills building. I think that that's so important and something else that we're really interested in working on in the theater area. But what I want to um, ask and kind of throw to you is a question about resources and cost, because that's certainly something that's come up a lot um, in, in our conversations. And really, where where's the funding? Where's the funding for the study? Where's the funding for next steps? Yeah. You are the goddess of that. Yeah. yeah. So, I know, it always comes down to nickels and dimes. So, so, hold on, I'm going to answer this because it's really important that we hear this. Um, and, and that those of you who can make something happen, keep making it happen. Um, we started the study with zero. We went to the Tulman Foundation. I hope Alex is listening on this HowlRound because Tulman led it. The Valentine Foundation led this. Lots of individual people on our Indiegogo led it. We were determined to really support a long-term research deep dive and to make this convening free. So we are still $30,000 away from the goal that we need to complete this research. And all of you listening out there, if this is important to you, figure out a way to help us match this and get this done. It will get done because it's fierce. And once it gets done, that $30,000, then what we want to do is convene a wider discussion among funders who care about this, about where those priorities are and how we can direct resources towards uh, some of these granular things that could get supported in the American theater in the future. So, 30,000. Thanks, Rachel. <laughs> Okay. Final three. Go ahead. Um, hi, I'm Julie Phelps. I'm the artistic director of Counterpulse. Um, one thing that came to mind to me today while I was listening, and also some of the provocations from the panelists around building something new, was looking towards where women have leadership and how women have leadership, not only looking towards the places where men have leadership and how women can aspire to attain that type of leadership. And I think it would be an interesting complement to today's study to look at how women are actually taking leadership in the arts field and how we can learn from what's coming from that leadership. Instead of just saying, oh, you're not the ED, you're not the AD, therefore there is no leadership, because I don't believe that's true. It's not my experience. So how are we taking leadership is something I want to discuss in the breakouts today. I'm Omi Jones, and I'm an artist scholar. And I want to say first that this is just fabulous, having this experience and to all the people who made this possible. Two quick things. One, to underscore the need for more study, so that now I know I need to go on the Indiegogo campaign and put in some money and encourage people to do that. This is one of many very important things that came up. Will those women who appear to be next in line to be ADs or EDs, do they want it? And five years from now, will they have gotten that? So a follow-up study, I think, is really important. The second thing, very quickly, I think it's important to note the variety of presentational styles that were part of this gathering, because changing the skin color, changing the genitalia of leadership does not guarantee a change right. in the aesthetic, does not change diversity in the ways that some of us wanted. But the presentations here suggested the kind of variety that I mean when I say diversity. So I want to thank you. other um, research and initiatives that are being developed by Lord in particular. This, this conversation, like we said, it's not new. People are talking about it. People in my generation are talking about it. All generations. And, and Lord in particular are looking at how we can expand access to and education about leaders, top leadership positions. And so from those conversations, what kind of has come out of that, in addition to more questions, is a program that's really focused on mentorship, and I'm hoping to talk more about it in the mentorship group, but it's about giving women and people of color access to those top leadership positions through training programs. Mm -hmm. And so we're working to get it funded um, because Kind of, I, one of the quotes up there that I saw earlier was about, you know, we're tired of working for free, but there's these programs and ideas people have, but it does take money to make sure that people can be compensated for the work that they're doing. And so, right now, one of the biggest barriers, I think, is getting those programs funded. And they're really fantastic ideas, and we all want them to happen, but we can't just make them happen out of thin air. So something to think about um, as we talk this afternoon. Thank, Thank you. you. Out, just a huge yelp of gratitude to this amazing group of people for it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
time, and it's uh, amazing to hear. So, if you're just here for this morning, we thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of our hearts for coming. Um, spread the word and, uh, and keep the conversation going. If you signed up to be part of a breakout session this afternoon, please, as you walk out of here, head on upstairs to a room that's called The Roof. Uh, our EUFF, -F, but it means up on the roof, um, for lunch, and then we will steer you towards your breakout session. So thank you, everybody. <laughs>